I guess I'll start out just with the same theme that uh, Abertikas was referring to because we're in that season approaching Easter, approaching our commemoration of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So I'm going to start with a story. This is one of my earliest memories. I was about probably four years old. I think, yeah, I was, I was about four years old at the time. I do remember this pretty well. My parents took me to some kind of a clinic in Lancaster, California. We lived out in the desert in Palmdale, but they, they took me up to Lancaster to this clinic. I'm four years old, and I find myself in a line with other small children like myself, and we're in this line. And this line is, you know, slowly progressing deeper and deeper inside the building. Up ahead, every once, you know, every uh, 30 seconds or so, I hear a yelp or an ouch or some, some kid crying. Ah! I say, oh, this is, you know, this is creepy. This is intimidating. And it's getting scarier as you get farther and farther up there. And then when I finally, it was my turn, and, oh, this nurse sticks this needle in my arm, and, ow, oh, that hurt. I, I hate needles, you know. It's, it's just, I've always hated sharp things. And God has really put me through it with sharp things in my life. I, when I had chemotherapy, and of course, you always, well, you got to have that needle put in your arm there to, you know, for the IV. And then, oh, well, in between treatments, the, one of the first things after chemo is a couple days later, you start got to giving yourself injections. And you diabetics know all about that sort of thing. Where I had to give myself injections to re, of this drug to rebuild my, you know, white cell count after each chemo treatment. So, you expect me to give myself a needle? You gotta be kidding. So here I was at four years old getting this shot. And yeah, it was a Salk polio vaccine. Now, of course, at that age, I didn't understand at the time what this experience was. I did realize later on that clear memory what that was all about because I learned about polio, the scourge that it was, especially back then. I've known a couple of people who ended up with polio, and it did cripple them, and it did shorten their lives. Uh, it was just a horrible scourge back then. And so when they developed the salt vaccine, well, hey, we've got we've to have our kids go and get this vaccine. And even though they have to suffer a little bit to receive it, it's something that could save their lives. And you know something? If somebody back then had wanted to really become rich, they would have opened an ice cream shop or a candy store right next to that clinic. They would have opened up a shop right there because after the kids came out, oh, it hurts. And, I just, ah. and the parents would feel so bad about it. And then they would take the kid next door and say, here, have some candy, have some ice cream, you'll feel better. <laughs> and the parents would assuage their own guilt over putting their kids through this suffering. You know, that would be a great way to have uh, really made a lot of money. Because let's face it, we, deep inside, we want to avoid suffering. We want to avoid pain. We want to avoid discomfort. We want to avoid trauma or stress or turbulence in our lives, all those things that just, oh, we, we really don't want that for ourselves or for those we care about. When others are going through something, we, we just don't want that. We want to protect from suffering. We want to prevent it. 
We would rather avoid any kind of pain or discomfort, even when it serves a good purpose. Like, how can suffering serve any good purpose? And a lot of people end up distancing themselves from God and say, no, I don't believe in God, or I reject him. Why? Because he allows this. Why does God allow this? You know, we turn to him, and it's not just physical pain and physical discomfort, but also it could be mental, it could be emotional, it could be spiritual. There's all kinds of suffering. Some of the worst suffering can be mental or emotional. And how many times do we turn to God for relief, and then that relief doesn't come when we want it or in the way we want it to. And we ask God, if you're really good, why would you let this happen? Why would we suffer? Well, today's passage from the lectionary, in this passage, Jesus taught us something about our attitude our attitude and approach to suffering. And what Christ says about it provides us with comfort and with guidance on how to handle it and how to endure it. Today we're going to be in the eighth chapter of Mark. Like I say, Bertikas just stole some of this, but we'll go through it again. Actually, we'll go through a little bit more of the context here. But it's in Mark 8. I'll be using the Phillips translation today. And for those of you unfamiliar with that, it was kind of a a translation paraphrase of the New Testament that J.B. Phillips did way decades and decades ago. But he was a Greek scholar and made a very readable and very clear kind of a paraphrased translation of the New Testament. I just pulled mine out recently. I'm going to start reading through the Phillips again just see what this take on on the scriptures has to offer and it's very very good so I'm using the Phillips today and we'll start in Mark 8 and in verse 31 it says and he began to teach them that it was inevitable that the son of man should go through much suffering and be utterly repudiated by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. He told them all this quite bluntly. This made Peter draw him on one side and take him to task about what he had said. But Jesus turned and faced his disciples and rebuked Peter. Out of my way, Satan, he said. Peter, you are not looking at things from God's point of view, but from man's. Jesus said he was going to suffer, and no, we can't allow this. I think it helps if we look at that word suffer, just what it originally meant. You know, we think, oh, well, suffer just means to, you know, means to have physical pain. Ouch. That, you know, some kind of pain, that that's, that's all that suffer means is just to hurt. But in the original meaning of the word, it's, it's more than that. Actually, suffer means to put up with, to bear, to endure, to submit to. If you want that original usage of the word, one of the best places, and this is my favorite scene in all the Lord of the Rings movies. And I love the Lord of the Rings movies, so if you don't, well, tough. In the last one, Return of the King, you have Aragorn, who is the rightful king of Gondor. And he is on a mission through the Dimvault Road, go to the area under the mountain to confront the the under-the-mountain people who are dead. Many years before, they had sworn an oath that they would come to Gondor's aid in time of need when they were up as the mountain people. And then when the time came, they did not fulfill their oath. And so they were cursed. And they were cursed that when they died, they would just 
be kind of the living dead. They would be these, you know, something between a ghost and a zombie, sort of, underneath the mountain, and that they would just be restless and ill at ease and never, you know, never at peace, and that they would have this terrible half existence until they had fulfilled their oath and come to Gondor's help. So Aragorn is on a mission underneath the mountain. He confronts this army of the dead. He confronts their king and says, I summon you to fulfill your oath. And if you do, then you will be released from this terrible half existence. You'll finally be able to waft away and be at peace. Well, the king of the dead says, the dead do not suffer the living to pass. You're not allowed down here. You're not allowed to go through here. You're not allowed to be here. And so you're going to die. We're going to kill you because we do not suffer you. We do not permit. We don't allow. We don't put up with it. And then Aragorn's reply was, you will suffer me. He was the king of Gondor. He had the authority. And they end up coming to Gondor's aid. They do fulfill their oath. And they are released from this awful half-life that they'd had. But when Aragorn says, you will suffer me, you will allow me, you will submit to me, you will put up with me, you're going to endure me, that's what suffering really meant. It has that element. Well, Jesus wanted to prepare his disciples for what was going to befall the Son of Man. And he taught them plainly, bluntly, as Phillips puts it. Without stories, no parables, just straight out. Hey guys, this is what's going to happen. He wanted them to understand, but of course they didn't. Peter loved Jesus. He rejected the idea that his Lord, his Master, would willingly submit to being unlawfully tortured and executed, that, that he would go ahead and, and accept suffering. You can't do that. You don't have to put up with that. That's what Peter was telling him. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to put up with that kind of treatment. And, you know, in looking at it from man's point of view, and he says, Peter, you're looking at this not from God's point of view, but from man's. And from man's point of view, no, Jesus didn't have to put up with that kind of a fate. He didn't have to go to the cross. He didn't have to go through that. He had miraculous power. He had enough followers to resist any arrest by those corrupt leaders of the, uh, you know, the Jewish faith at that time. He could just simply have left Jerusalem. I mean, Jesus could have probably avoided capture indefinitely. No, he didn't have to go through this. And that's what Peter was saying. You don't have to put up with that. You don't have to suffer. Well, if we go back to the beginning, right before Jesus began his ministry, you know, he went out into the desert, a 40-day fast where he was just starving and weak. And then found himself confronted by Satan, the tempter. And back then, the tempter tried to lure Jesus into taking the easy way out of his calling. Satan was trying this tactic. He said, hey, you want to, you know, be the Lord and Master of all humanity, of all the earth. Well, you, you know, and, and, and you can do that. You can do that. You can take the easy way out. What Satan offered back at that time was, here's the crown without the cross. You don't have to get it that way. And so, going back to this account, 
out of his misguided love. You know, Peter's words were tempting Jesus to accept that same offer. Hey, you don't have to put up, you don't have to suffer, you don't have to do this, go through this. You know, take, take the crown without the cross. They were all waiting for him to call down those legions of angels and throw the Romans out and take the crown without the cross. And so that's why Jesus called Peter Satan at that moment because Peter had just allied himself with the tempter, making him the same offer. Suggesting the same thing. No, we don't want suffering. We don't want suffering for ourselves. We don't want it for others. And we want the crown. Sure, we want the pinnacle of life, but we want it without the cross. And unfortunately, that's not always possible. I think back to, uh, you know, my best um, primary care physician many years ago. I was having some really bad health problems. I had panic attacks and uh, I was going through all kinds of awful things like that. And finally, I had a consultation with my doctor and he said, okay, here's your situation. Here are steps you need to take. Here are some things you need to go through. Here are some things you have to do in order to get better. No, you're not going to get a magic pill that's just going to fix everything. And you need to do A, B, C. And I remember I was sitting there and I was kind of squirming. I was literally squirming in my chair. I didn't want to look at him. I was just squirming in my chair. And he leaned forward and he said, do I sense some resistance here? <laughs> I wanted that crown of perfect health without the cross of going through the therapy. I just wanted a cure without having to go through therapy, without having to go through all these hoops. No, just, just give me some pill that just fixes it. That, you know, we, we want the crown without the cross. Every time I see all these TV ads for the latest drug, it'll solve your problems. It's kind of like you can have the cure, you can have the crown without the cross, in effect. Especially the ones for skin trouble, because I've had a lot of skin problems. You know, the ones for eczema, and especially in college, I had awful outbreaks of eczema. Just awful. Well, there's this wonderful drug out there, and hey, take this, and it'll magically make your skin better in no time at all, and it's just wonderful. And then they give you the fine print verbiage about all of the possible side effects. One of which is lymphoma, which I have had. <laughs> and I'm not crazy about. <laughs> I said, no, I, you know, you're offering a crown without the cross, but if you accept that offer, if you try to take the easy way to not suffer at all, you find that it can often backfire and you can end up actually worse off. Sometimes the crown requires the cross. So the key to all this is how we respond to suffering. If we don't first seek God's mind and heart on the matter, we can make the same mistake Peter made. We can complain the suffering we or a loved one endures is pointless, and maybe it is. We can complain that it's unjust, and maybe it is. We can complain that it's unacceptable because, let's face it, Suffering is unacceptable. We just don't want anything to do with it. It's part of our human condition, but it's a part we do not want to have. And yet, there it is. And this drive, this innate drive that we naturally have to avoid and prevent suffering, let's face it, it's pervasive. I mean, you watch the evening news, and it's something I've noticed here over these last few years particular since COVID hit, a lot of the news stories and they'll say, oh, well, we had this uh, local tragedy and, or this uh, problem or whatever. And so, oh, wow, we need to be safe. We need to be safe. We need to be safe. 
I keep hearing the word safe and safety and safe and safety in news stories where it used to be just, well, there was an accident and this is what happened. But now it's, there was an accident, this is what happened. And, well, we've got to be safe. It's like that's a tagline now. Because we don't want any suffering, especially in, in our time now, there seems to be a greater push toward trying to, in this society, to try to alleviate all discomfort. And in such a society where we want to make things safe, 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 Christ's attitude towards suffering is hard to swallow because he said, well, hey, I'm going to go through this. And I've come on purpose to go through this. What? If we're going to live like Christ, then we need to learn how to handle suffering as he did. And that's where he follows up here in Mark 8. When he says, you're not looking at things from God's point of view, but from man's. And then he gives the disciples some instruction. Mark 8, verse 34. Then he called the disciples and the people around him and said to them, If anyone wants to follow in my footsteps, he must give up all right to himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The man who tries to save his life will lose it. It is the man who loses his life for my sake and the gospel's who will save it. What good can it do a man to gain the whole world at the price of his own soul? What can a man offer to buy back his soul once he has lost it? Yeah, he's asking us, you gain the whole world at the price of your soul. You gain total freedom from all suffering, the absence of anything uncomfortable. You can have that total ease, you know, perfect health and everything else. And yet, if you gain that at the price of your soul, what good is it? He says, his instructions are, we give up our right to ourselves, our right to call our own shots, that we're following him. And we're doing this for his sake because we're his, because we belong to him, we follow him, and for the gospels, for the good news that he preached, for the way that he taught, for the sake of, all, of himself and everything that he has said and told us and his purpose for us, for the sake of all that, well, we take up our cross and we follow him. We take up those things that amount to suffering. He used that metaphor, the cross, a source of shame, but a source of glory. The cross for Jesus happened regardless of any human desire otherwise, regardless of any desire to avoid suffering. That's the image that Jesus used. He described our suffering for his sake. We're living not to suit ourselves, but we put up with certain things. We'll bear things. We'll endure things. We'll even lose in order to follow him. And to those who are suffering, it's easy. We perceive only the pain, but we suffer with Christ. And he suffers with us, and our suffering is never wasted. Here I want to mention a couple of verses, and you don't have this back there to put up on the stage. It's something that came to me kind of late, but it helps fill, fill out this, um, this attitude towards suffering that Jesus taught us. In 1 Peter 4, and beginning in verse 12, it says, And now, dear friends of mine, I beg you, not to be unduly alarmed at the fiery ordeals which come to test your faith, as though this were some abnormal experience. You should be glad because it means that you are called to share Christ's sufferings. We share in his sufferings as he shares in ours. 
and we all suffer together. Yes, things are not perfect in our world, not perfect in ourselves. And so sometimes, well, we take up our cross and we bear whatever it is that God has called upon us to put up with. Now it's time for the bird. First bird. Now this, this is the one that looks like Terry. Okay. Oiled. <laughs> yeah. Looks just like you. Right? <laughs> you know, a lot of times birds will get caught up in oil slicks out there in the ocean or along the coast, like this one. In an oiled bird like this, um, the trouble is that oil gets in there, creeps into the feathers and underneath, and, and it takes away the insulating qualities of the feathers. It can also slow down the ability of the bird to, to swim and to dive and to catch fish. Um, yeah, it's very dangerous. And a bird like this, it could have hypothermia. It could have hyperthermia. Having all this coat of oil all over it can make it either get too cold or too hot, not regulate its body heat. A lot of times a bird like this hasn't eaten in days. It's dehydrated. It's exhausted. And yet, you know, unless it's really weak, why? I'd say, you know, this oiled bird is going to resist capture. So, no. No, I'm not sorry. I want to keep doing what I'm doing. I mean, you know, anything but swimming around and looking for fish is, is suffering. And I want to keep, you know, just swimming around looking for fish. I don't want to suffer having to go through a cleaning process. And, and yet, well... You got this oil on you, and you need to pick up that cross and, and do what's right. So the bird gets captured. The first thing they have to do, they have to stabilize it. You can't just immediately clean it up. The bird's freaked out. It's, it's really in bad shape, and it has to go through this process, a process of cleaning. They get stabilized first. It might take two, three days, four days to force feed it, to get the bird stronger and in good enough shape where they can finally go through the cleaning of it. And once they have the stabilized bird, well, it has a much higher survival rate than those that aren't stabilized before they're washed. Well, once you finally got the bird kind of in stable condition, so okay, now we can take this gunk off. And the thing they found that really works the best, the rescue folks that do this work, they found that the magic formula for getting it off is Dawn dishwashing detergent. Dawn in particular, dishwashing liquid. It's great. You start getting a good coat of Dawn dishwashing liquid on this bird, it takes about 45 minutes, 45 minutes of careful work. And the bird has to put up with this, all this handling and this scrubbing and this picking, you know, and this brushing. It has to put up with this for 45 minutes for the wash and rinse. And then, okay, now after it's all cleaned up, okay, we need to make sure it's stable again, let it calm down. It has to go through this real process, a lot of suffering, in order to get well to where it can be released back out into the wild. And the process as a whole, it might take five days. It usually takes around seven. So this is a whole week of trauma for an oiled bird to get cleaned up and be in good enough shape that it can go back out and live the way it was meant to live. And the bird has to basically suffer. Yes, it has to surrender. It has to put up with 
this treatment. It has to endure it. And to be like Christ, even in his suffering, Jesus said that we must deny ourselves. And like an oiled bird, we have to submit to the process. Denying ourselves means resisting that natural inclination to insist upon comfort and painlessness. You know, sometimes you just have to allow it. We have to, in, to resist that inclination. We have to resist the inclination to accept the devil's offer of a crown without a cross. In the midst of our pain, we need to turn to God so he can help us have his concerns in mind, first and foremost, and not merely our human concerns. Instead of telling God, hey, I'm in pain, take this away. We could pray, Father, I'm hurting. Please end my suffering. If not, help me endure with joy and contentment. We can pray like Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, I don't want to go through this. If there's any other way. Jesus didn't want to suffer. And yet, not as I will, but as you will. That he would carry the cross. If that's what it took. If there were another way that God the Son and the Spirit, you know, the Father, Son, and Spirit had come up with another way that they were going to accomplish our redemption and our reconciliation to them and secure our eternal future. If there had been some other way to do this, then, well, by all means, <laughs> because Jesus didn't want to suffer any more than we do. And yet, he had that same attitude that we read when Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Okay, you know, suffering terribly, but would still trust that God knows far more and far better than we do. So I think really the upshot of all this, of the attitude that Jesus taught us in this passage about suffering, is that we take up our cross, we follow him, yes, and if that means suffering, so be it. Oswald Chambers put it this way. No healthy saint ever chooses suffering. He chooses God's will, as Jesus did, whether it means suffering or not. We take up our cross and we follow him. If that means suffering, so be it. But we're following him. And there's good news in taking up your cross, in suffering with Christ, in following him as we bear whatever crosses we have. Whatever situation we're walking into, the Son has already scouted it. Jesus himself has entered your trial. He's ensured that there's a way to bear it. Whatever befalls you, Jesus has already promised your victory. And you can bring up that last bird. Yep, when you go through, yes, we'll all be pure and white as snow. It's going to be incredible beyond anything we can imagine. Jesus has entered our trials. He has ensured that there's a way to bear it. We don't want to bear it, but if, if that's what it takes to follow him, then we do. He's promised our victory. If God be for us, who can be against us? So may we take comfort in our suffering, knowing that Jesus is with us and that he goes before us. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Lord, thank you for being with us. Uh, I don't really understand so often the trials and tribulations of this life, uh, necessarily why you allow things, and you know, sometimes you just wonder what in the world is going on. Uh, 
when things go bad. But you are good. You are God. This is your universe. We are your children. And you're working out something that is so far beyond our pay grade. Help us to trust you, to take up our cross, to follow you, to choose to do your will, even when it means that we have to lose something, go through some kind of pain or discomfort or difficulty, that we do it for your sake in order to follow you, that we do it for the gospel's sake in order to do the way that you have and live the way that you have taught us to live. Help us, Father, to bear our cross and to follow you and to do it joyfully and to rejoice that we can be partakers of your son's suffering, that we have that bond with you and that's eternal and unbreakable and that you're going to bring us through this into a glorious eternity where we are finally released and white as snow. Thank you, Father, for the promise and grant us the faith, the hope, the trust, and especially the love for you and for each other, and for the world that you have called us to. Thank you, Father, and glorify yourself in us. We commit ourselves to you through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Do the benediction. May the love of the Father, the tenderness of the Son, and the presence of the Spirit gladden your heart and bring peace to your soul this day and all days. Amen. Go in peace.